Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vision Seminar. It's a pleasure to have today Spandan Madan uh, from here. Uh, he's a PhD student at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, where he's advised by Hans Peter Pfizer, and he's closely collaborating with the MIT Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Uh, his research focuses on building control environments and building tools for better understanding computer vision models. And before this, Spandan completed his Master's of Engineering in Computational Science and Engineering at Harvard and received his bachelor at IIT Delhi in India. He was also the recipient of the SNAP Research Scholarship in 2018 and a Harvard SEAS Fellowship in 2017. Spandan has also worked as a visiting research assistant at MIT and also as a research intern at Microsoft Research and at Adobe Research. Spandan, thanks for coming and all yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. <clears throat> thanks a lot for inviting me. So hello everybody. Uh, Welcome to the presentation. Thanks for taking our time. And uh, I mean, I had a I had a slot for a quick introduction, but but they gave us gave me a very nice introduction. So thanks thanks for that. Um, great. So today I'll be presenting uh, some of our recent work on understanding the generalization behavior of CNNs. And uh, this is a project that I initially started at MIT when I was working with Professor Fredo Duran. And I'm super excited that you know we got some results, and I'm very happy to share with you this work and looking forward to your feedback. So. Just make sure everything works. So just to make sure I'm audible perfectly and my screen is visible, right? Great. Cool. Because I, I can't really see the green window around the shared screen, so which is why it's surprising. But okay, I'm assuming the shared screen works fine. It's working okay. fine. Okay, sounds good. Great, so um, one very remarkable thing that we all are aware about human vision is that uh, it generalizes effortlessly. So, you know, if I was to show you these two pictures, which is a picture of a Ford Thunderbird from the front and a Mitsubishi Lancer from the side, um, it would be super easy for you to generalize to this new picture if I asked you what car it is and where you're looking at it from. So it's very straightforward for you to say it's a Ford Thunderbird and you're looking at it from the side. Uh, so the question we want to ask is, can modern CNNs do this? Uh, can they generalize to this third image if they're only shown the first two images? So some of the recent work suggests that it might be hard. This might not be super straightforward. Um, there are works which have looked at uh, rotation viewpoints, uh, slight, slight shifts in image, and they show that networks are very brittle to these shifts. So you can rotate the image in 2D, that can break the image. If you just shift the image by one pixel or two, that can also break, break, uh, break the network. Um, there's also recent work which looked at this in 3D. So people, this is from this is work from uh, MITC BMM, uh, and I believe also MITC CL together, uh, where they went and collected uh, objects in non-canonical 3D poses. This is a paper called ObjectNet, and they found that there's, a, there's a huge dip in performance of networks if you test on on images from non-canonical poses. Uh, while the first one here shown is probably addressable with data augmentation because it's 2D transformations, the third one is not very easy to tackle because you can't really augment with 3D transformations. Um, so motiva motivated by such uh, problems pretty much, um, the, the, first, the first thing you would come up with is, can I somehow collect more data? Can I collect data which can help me address this problem? And of course, that's a losing battle because if you have multiple objects in the scene, uh, it's very hard for you to connect a data set with all possible objects in all locations, with all backgrounds, with all textures. That's of course a losing battle. So it's straightforward. It's pretty clear that generalization to understand objects to new viewpoints uh, is essential, but it's unclear when and how such generalization, generalization may be possible. So it's unclear when networks may be able to generalize to new object viewpoint combinations. So that's object category viewpoint combinations and what can enable such generalization. And that's the central idea of this, of this uh, research work that, we, that I'm presenting here today. So more concretely, uh, the research questions are twofold. First of all, uh, we wanna know, can CNNs generalize to unseen category viewpoint combinations? To, so just to elaborate, uh, what I mean by unseen here is that these combinations of categories and viewpoints have not been seen during training. More specifically, we wanna know what is the role of data diversity here? Uh, that is the number of combinations that you show the network during training. And what is the role of architectural choices? So are some architectures better at generalizing uh, or is, is it a mixed bag where pretty much everything performs randomly just as well? Uh, the second question is, uh, what is the underlying mechanism that drives this generalization behavior? So uh, if we do find some patterns, uh, what is it that's driving this, these patterns? 
and, and can that be influenced somehow? What is the role of individual neurons? Um, does selectivity and invariance have a role to play? So selectivity and invariance have a long history in understanding network generalization or in gen generalization in machine learning settings. Uh, does that have a role to play here in this context of generalizing to unseen category pose category viewpoint combinations? Just as a quick reminder, it's always a multitask setting. So uh, very often in computer vision, we talk about classification or basically visual recognition uh, with viewpoint invariance. So here we're not trying to solve just category prediction. We're doing a multitask setting where the task is to predict both the category and the viewpoint of the object that you're looking at. So since a lot of these ideas that I've been talking about are revolving around controlling data diversity or controlling the number of category of category viewpoint combinations shown to the network. Uh, the first question is, how do we quantitatively control this thing? So how do we quantitatively control the number of combinations that a network sees during training? So for this, we first started uh, by building category viewpoint data sets. So we collected one and built three pretty much. Uh, the easiest ones to start were variations of the MNIST data set. So we took MNIST and we extended them with two other parameters. So we made the MNIST location data set where MNIST images were basically put on an empty three by three grid. So that's nine different positions or locations, so to say. Uh, so this is basically MNIST augmented with location. And then we have MNIST augmented with scale where we rescaled MNIST images and then padded it to back to become the same size as original MNIST images. So these are sort of toy data sets which enable us to understand the whole paradigm and give us a sort of a first poke at the problem and I'll present more complicated data sets as, as I move forward. But yeah, so starting with these data sets, uh, I'd like to explain our strategy for creating different test and train data sets where we can control the amount of bias. So uh, what I have here shown is basically, uh, we call this the image grid. Uh, the idea is simply that it's representing the entire data set where every cell here represents all images from one particular category viewpoint combination. So along the row, you can see that the digit is kept constant. So the category is kept constant. And along the column, you can see in this case, the, the location position is kept constant. Um, and by, so each of these cells represents all possible Im images from one combination. So the first thing we do is we build a test set. We basically pick out a bunch of uh, cells here, uh, which makes our test set, which is never shown to any network during training. So this is completely unseen. Uh, what this means is that uh, none of the images from these combinations will be seen during training. Uh, they are only used for testing and we don't use it for any hyperparameter or any, any validation. It's just for reporting purposes. So uh, that's the test set. And one thing you will observe here is that we've ensured that in every row and in every column, we have only one cell selected. The reason for that is just to ensure that all categories and all viewpoints get an equal treatment and ensuring that each of the two axes, which is the categories and viewpoints itself also get symmetric treatment. So this is just to ensure that there's no biases creeping in from our selection of the test set. Great, and once we have these held out from the remaining, we can build different train sets. So we can build different train sets with an increasing number of combinations shown during training. So here I'm showing the train set where 30% combinations or compositions have been shown. Uh, we build multiple train sets with say 10, 20, 30%, so on. Uh, and then we basically train networks on them and test how they perform on this held out test set of combinations that have never been seen before. So while this is a good way to you know test this idea, the problem with this data set is MNIST is super simple. So we wanted to extend these, these ideas to a natural data set as well. So we collected this, uh, we, we used this data set called the iLab data set, which is basically a data set of uh, viewpoints of different objects. So it's physical toy objects that have been placed on a turntable. Here we're showing uh, viewpoints of one particular object, different azimuths, different uh, uh, elevation angles, and uh, they're on different backgrounds. So specifically for our purpose, um, we took six different object categories, bus, car, helicopter, monster, truck, plane, and tank. And then we used five different elevations and six azimuths here. Uh, what we did is we didn't predict the elevations. We only predicted the azimuth pin which is a lot like some of the other works that before us have done for viewpoint uh, estimation. Um, and there's about 117 backgrounds for this uh, data set. So it make, it's a pretty good data set to ensure that you can test in a controlled environment how networks generalize uh, on natural images. Uh, one good thing about this data set is that there's intra-class diversity. So every category, for example, a bus here, there will be multiple bus toys that, you use to, that they use to make this data set. So that enables intra-class diversity as well. 
Um, another thing that we, the, so one problem with this data set that we realized was that um, it's, it's great, it's natural data, but it's too simplistic in the sense that there's one single centered object um, and you know there's not a lot of background variation because the backgrounds are just textures that have been pasted on the turntable. So uh, in order to extend this to more uh, challenging environments, we created our own data set, uh, which we called the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. So just, just to repeat, um, we're using the same ideology that we that we used before uh, in this data set as well. So we start with the um, all combinations that have been shown here on the top left. So this is the image grid, which shows all images. Then we have the test combinations held out, and then we have the scene combinations, different number of train sets uh, built by picking different number of held out uh, combinations that are not used during uh, testing. Right. So. In order to, to test uh, the same ideology in a more challenging environment, uh, we also created our own data set, which, is, which we call the biased cars data set. Uh, so this is a data set of cars placed in a 3D city. We would place uh, 3D assets in a, in a 3D city and then render it. And some of the features about this data set uh, that sort of made it important for our study is that first of all, it, it provides complete control on the viewpoint of uh, an object category. So you have complete control over the joint distribution. Uh, secondly, there's diversity in the background. So there's randomized textures, there's sky maps, there's multiple tree models, pedestrians, building materials, road textures. So it really allows you to, to make the images much more complicated and, and, and differ from one another. And secondly, uh, and thirdly, it's photorealistic. So we use for physically based rendering, which ensures that you can get subtle reflections and uh, shadows and lighting effects correctly. So as you can see in the third column, first row, uh, there's a tree being reflected on on the on the bonnet of the car and the windshield of the car, and this is something you wouldn't very get usually if you're using standard rendering practices. Uh, finally, it's all randomized, so we use multiple 3D cities, and this prevents memorization. So there's here's some more examples of of the city, and uh, we we do plan to make this data set available. So if you want to use this data or similar looking data for your own projects, do let me know. Uh, we can also make the the code to render this, this kind of city available to you as well. So again, just to reiterate, we have one unseen test set and multiple train sets, uh, which have been made using the grid approach that I talked earlier. So we use the same approach here for the biased cars and for all of these four data sets, we, we build different, um, different train and test sets like this, where the test set is never seen and the combinations in the test set are never seen during training. Cool, so I just talked about how we can control the data diversity that we showed at the network. And now let's just talk about the different architectural choices that we're going to play around, play around with. So uh, we first of all started by uh, defining two different backbone agnostic architectures, uh, which are used commonly in multitask networks. And uh, we call these the shared and the separate architectures. So you can see the shared one here. Uh, as you can see in the shared architecture, you basically don't have any information shared between the two different, uh, so sorry, in, in the shared case, you have all the information shared between the two different tasks. So if you're predicting both category and viewpoint, right up until the last layer, right before the fully connected layer, uh, the information is being shared. So the representation that you learn in such a case is forced to retain information about both category and viewpoint tasks. Um, in the separate case, as you can see, um, there's no information shared. So representations are free to learn whatever they want. If they want to retain information about the two tasks, they can, if it helps. Uh, if it doesn't, they will not try to retain information about both the tasks. Uh, finally, in order to understand how information, how, how the results vary as we interpolate between them, we also define different architectures like the split one, split two, split three, which have been split after one, two, three blocks, so to say, uh, convolutional blocks, uh, which enables us to understand how the behavior interpolates between shared and separate architectures. Uh, and since these are backbone agnostic, uh, we can basically create these architectures for any backbone. And we, particularly in this study, use ResNet DenseNet, ResNext, Inception, and ViResNet. So just to summarize the setup, um, what we're trying to do here is simultaneous category and viewpoint prediction. And by viewpoint, I mean azimuth bin prediction. So we cast both these problems as classification problems, uh, and we keep the number of, cat number of classes for category and viewpoint same, just to ensure symmetric behavior. And uh, in, the train, in the train setting, you would show the network these two, in these two kinds of images, a Ford from the front, a Mitsubishi from the side. And then when you test it, uh, the idea is to test it on combinations never seen before, for example, this Ford from the side. Specifically, we want to understand the role of data diversity, uh, which we can do by holding out this test set, 
and then making different train sets with different kinds of combinations that have never been seen before. And finally, uh, we want to study the role of architecture. So we have these shared, separate, and interpolations between them, which are backbone agnostic. Cool. So that's the problem setup. Uh, if there's any questions up until here, I'd be happy to take them before I start with the findings. Cool. So since there are no questions, I can move on to the findings. Um, great. So uh, let's first try to understand what we found about the impact of data diversity. So if we look at this graph here. Uh, what you can see is that if you if you look at the dotted lines here, what we're showing is the performance of these networks, the shared and the separate networks, on new images from previously seen combinations. So what you can see is that as you add more and more data to the mix, as you add more and more diversity to the mix, uh, performance slightly dips on scene combinations, which kind of makes sense because now the task is getting slightly harder. There's more things to predict. So it makes sense that the performance is dipping a little bit. But the more interesting thing here to see is the solid lines, because what they show is that as you increase data diversity, so as you move forward in the graph uh, along the x-axis, you can see that um, the blue line and the red line, solid lines, both rise. What that means is that uh, both shared and separate networks start getting better on unseen combinations as they see more combinations. Um, while this may seem trivial at first sight, it's important to understand that in most standard computer vision settings, we use randomized training and testing data sets. So what that means is that the distribution of the train and the test data is the same. Here we have ensured for sure that uh, with complete control that the distribution is disjoint. So the distribution is not the same for the train and the test data sets. So uh, what this shows is that if you show more training, training combinations uh, with more data diversity, your network can actually start extrapolating to combinations that have never seen before. So uh, this result is consistent across all four data sets that I've presented here. Uh, as you can see, the, the solid lines always rise up uh, in all the cases. And the takeaway message here is that data diversity can enable extrapolation. Um, and while this is a finding that we have specifically for category and viewpoint combinations, uh, we do believe that this is an interesting finding, which which would be good to extend to other ideas, and that I will talk about talk a little bit about this in the future work. Uh, but yeah, so that's the impact of data diversity. And the next question is, uh, which architectures can facilitate this behavior better? So if we zoom into the into the same uh, graph again. What we see here is that the blue line, um, the blue solid line is always above the red solid line. What that means is that the shared network is actually doing much better than the, uh, the separate network is doing much better than the shared network. So on the dotted lines, the performance is pretty much similar. So for scene combinations, for new images from scene combinations, uh, so if you're testing on new images from within the data distribution, what you're getting is pretty much similar performance. Um, but if you test outside the train distribution, what you see is that separate significantly outperforms the shared ones on unseen combinations. So separate is better at generalizing to unseen combinations. And again, this is a result that's consistent across all four data sets. And uh, yeah, we think it's quite exciting that, uh, so just a, just a quick note here. Um, when we presented this to other people as well, the first question that comes to mind is literature on multitask learning, which says that sharing helps regularize networks and leads to better performance. Um, the, the difference here is that we are actually testing outside the training distribution. So if you, so I, what I would say is that if you look at the dotted lines, which is a very similar setup to typical multitask learning setups, uh, the, the performance is either pretty much the same or, I mean, it, or just for the bias cars case, the shared one actually does outperform the, the separate case which is something that you would expect in a typical multitask learning setup. But if you test generalization beyond the training distribution, uh, this gets revealed to us, which is that you can see the solid lines uh, separate outperforming shared ones significantly. So the first thing we wanted to do was confirm that these results stand. So we went, went and did, did a few controls. So the first control was just testing with different backbones. And as you can see, it's consistent across all backbones. Uh, we have four shown here and it's consistent across all of these. So the blue solid line is always above the red solid line. The separate networks always outperform shared ones um, when you're testing on unseen combinations. The second is since we, this, since we see this stark difference every time, we wanted to interpolate between these architectures. And what we see is a very beautiful gradual transition. So if you interpolate between the separate and the shared architectures, that is you sort of interpolate the amount of information that is being shared or the representation that is forced to be shared 
what you see is that uh, there is a gradual dip. It's the best when there is no information shared and it slowly keeps dipping as you share more and more information till the last case where you reach the shared case where you're sharing complete information between the two tasks. Uh, the third control is the width of the network. So uh, if because we're doing this shared and separate kind of uh, setup, when we do share, when we do se make separate networks, uh, there is more neurons per layer because now you have two different uh, convolutional layers in that in that particular branch. So uh, just to ensure that that was not at play, we played with different widths for networks. And uh, what we showed here is that even at one sixteenth the width, uh, the separate one outperforms the shared one. So what you're seeing here in the right graph, which is separate one fourth. That's one sixteenth of the shared wide four times, but still the behavior is the same. So that that just proves that width is not the factor that's controlling this. And lastly, uh, we want to understand uh, if if the if data set size has a role to play here, because that's uh, conventionally a very important thing in in like deep learning driven studies. So, what do we start? What if uh, what's the impact of data to size as compared to data diversity instead of data diversity? Uh, so we plot here results on an increasing number of images from say 8750 to 70,000 images. And what I'm showing here is that uh, the behavior stays consistent. So the behavior is consistent across different data sizes. If I did keep reducing data size, data size further, it would start deteriorating. At that point, the network would just not be learning anything. But as long as the networks are learning something significant, uh, you can see that data diversity is far more important and data size doesn't really matter for this trend. Great. So uh, just a quick recap, uh, what we've seen so far is that uh, we're studying generalization in a multitask setting. And the first question we asked is, do CNNs generalize? Uh, why is it important? It's important because we can't really show all possible combinations to the network. So it would, it would be really nice if networks could generalize. And the answer is, yes, there's hope. Uh, if we do the right things with the right data diversity, with the right architectures, networks do tend to generalize pretty well. In fact, if you remember the graphs before, the accuracies can reach fairly high by the end of the by the end of the hoop. So by, by, by the time we've show, shown enough data diversity, networks can actually start generalizing well. The second question is, uh, what is the role of data diversity? And the answer is diversity can help generalize to even unseen settings. So this, as I said, is not trivial. It's not expected uh, in the sense that uh, it's not necessarily important that this should have happened but it's nice that it has happened. So diversity can help generalize networks, not just to within the data distribution, but also beyond the data distribution. And finally, the question is, what is the role of architectures? And what you find is that separate architectures significantly outperform shared ones when you're testing on unseen combinations. So the natural question that comes up here is, uh, why is this happening? What are the mechanisms that drive this generalization behavior? Can we understand it? Can we enforce it? Uh, so on and so forth. So first of all, just to give a, a, a more sort of, just to make sure that neural mechanisms is not a phrase that's used ambiguously here, just to explain what I mean by that. Um, uh, the way we're looking at it, it is that we're change, we're, we're sort of playing with knobs on the input and on the architecture side. And what we're getting up is performance in the end. Uh, so what we care about is what kind of representations enable better generalization. So, if I made a de certain design decision, like for example, a data diversity or architectural choice, um, and I see that there is an impact in performance, uh, to say that I understand the mechanism, one way to look at it is to say, do you understand how this architectural choice or how this design decision impacts the representations and how do these representations enable better generalization? So the stepping stone for the mechanism that we use in between is the representation of the final layer, you know, right before the fully connected layer. So, um, Specifically with respect to uh, representations that enable better generalization, uh, in, in standard uh, computer vision works over the decades, people have found that selective and invariant representations play an extremely important role in generalization. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about selective and invariant representations just so that uh, uh, I explain what I mean by them specifically in the context of this study. But uh, we tend to look at uh, individual neurons as image feature detectors. And uh, in principle, what selectivity and invariance are doing is that they're formalizing the behavior of a neuron in terms of how it fires for a particular feature as compared to how it fires for other features. Now, a uh, feature here is um, by design left ambiguous in, this, in the sense that you could define this selectivity and invariance with respect to a low level feature like color, or you could define it with respect to a high level feature like something uh, which is very indicative of a particular category like a dog or, or a car. So in principle, you could define this with respect to any 
feature that you care about. Uh, specifically in our context, let's try to understand what we mean by selectivity invariance. Uh, so what I'm showing here again is the image grid for uh, iLab, the iLab data set. And uh, as I explained before, what, what this means is that there's categories on the, on the rows and viewpoints in the columns, and every cell represents all possible images for one particular category viewpoint combination. Uh, so if we just zoom in on this first category, which is the car, let's try to define what selectivity and invariance would mean in the context of a single neuron, uh, specifically in this category viewpoint combination. So if a neuron is selective to car, uh, it means that it will fire only if car is present. So if, if anything else is present, it's not going to fire. Uh, that means it's selective to fire. It gets activated when it sees a car. And if it's invariant to viewpoint, that means that it will fire similarly no matter how this car looks. So no matter what viewpoint you look at this car from, no matter what uh, color or texture this car is, it's going to be uh, it's going to be firing the same. So invariance to viewpoint specifically means that its uh, activation will not change as viewpoint is varied. So as you can see intuitively, if I have these two things, if I have a neuron which can fire uh, when only a car is present and it doesn't change, the firing doesn't change um, uh, depending upon what viewpoint I'm looking at the car, this activation could basically be thought of as a signature for this category. So if I can look for this signature being uh, shown in the network, I can, solve I can solve classification for this category perfectly if I have a bunch of neurons that are car selective and viewpoint invariant. So um, a selective and invariant uh, neuron would basically fire for a car image and it would fire in irrespective of what viewpoint you see it at. Um, but it's also important to understand that generalization requires both. Uh, so, so how does this enable generalization? Well, of course, if I've shown a network for Thunderbirds and uh, Mitsubishi Lancers, and now I test on a four Thunderbird shown from the side, since the network is selective, it will definitely fire. Uh, since, sorry, since the neuron is selective, it will definitely fire for this new image. Also, since it's invariant to the viewpoint, its firing would be independent of whether you're seeing it from the front or from the side. So that explains why you should be able to get very good generalization performance if you have both selectivity and invariance. Uh, it's important to understand that you need both of these simultaneously. Just one is not enough uh, because just as a, as, a, as a pathological case, understand that uh, if the neuron never fires for any image, it's invariant to viewpoint uh, because it's always firing zero. But that's not enough. You also need selectivity to in, add it to the mix in order to get good classification accuracy. So that sort of explains uh, at an intuitive level what selectivity invariance means specifically in our context, uh, but how do we measure it? Um, so again, going back to this grid, uh, what I'm showing is the image grid that, that I've explained before. And uh, what, what I'm gonna explain now is in very analogous grid called the activations grid. So the idea here is very simple that um, for every single neuron, so, so the activations grid is defined for a single neuron uh, on a single neuron basis. And what this shows is the average firing rate of this neuron or the average activation of this neuron for all images coming from one particular category post combination. So one cell here, so cell I comma J would basically be the average activations of all images with category I and viewpoint J. Uh, we, have, we have these activations normalized just to, to lie between zero and one, just to ensure that there's no funny business going on with one neuron in general firing lesser across the data set as compared to other, other, other uh, neurons in the data set. So, that's what this activation grid is showing. And essentially, uh, this is an attempt to capture how a neuron fires for a particular combination as compared to other combinations. So just, just a visual representation of that. And uh, let's try to like, take a look at some uh, activation grids and understand how they would look for some selective and invariant neurons. So first up, first up we have this neuron, which is uh, firing along this particular row. Um, and as you can see here, uh, since it's firing for one particular pose, and it doesn't really get affected by what category you show it at. Uh, it's a neuron which is selective to pose and invariant to category. Similarly, this one fires for one category and it doesn't really care what pose you show it at. So this is basically a neuron, neuron which is selective to category and invariant to pose. Uh, similarly, we can define neurons which aren't selective, invariant, which are selective or not invariant, so on and so forth. But again, the bottom three are not really important to us because as we showed earlier, the first two, the first row here is what enables good generalization uh, across uh, so the first one is going to enable great viewpoint estimation a pose estimation and the second one is going to enable great uh, object classification or category prediction great so now that we have these visual representations the next step is to quantify this behavior and uh, the way we do that is using selectivity and invariance scores 
so selectivity score is so let's just pick this one um, uh, neuron which is category selective and pose invariant or viewpoint invariant. Uh, and how do we measure its selectivity score? Is that we first of all start by picking the 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 preferred category, which is basically the category it likes to get activated for or fires for the most. So we we go and check across all categories in the data set and pick the one that it fires the most for on average. Uh, then we get the average firing rate for this particular category and the average firing rate across all other categories. And then we just measure the, the distance between these two averages. And essentially uh, what we're trying to do is we're measuring the distance between a neuron's firing rate for its most liked category versus all other categories. So it's almost like going out and, and seeing what someone is good at, good at and then test and then basically measuring how how good are they at that job as compared to everything else they do as a means to understand how specialized they are at that particular job. Uh, so that's the selectivity score and and this allows us to quantify the selectivity of a particular neuron at an individual neuron level. Uh, the next thing is the invariant score, which is essentially trying to capture how much does this uh, activation change as it changes the preferred category. So here we are defining the invariant score with respect to viewpoint. So essentially what we want to get is uh, a range of the activations as the viewpoint is changed for the preferred category. So uh, here's the mathematical formula for that. And the reason we are subtracting that range from one is just because invariance is maximum when the range is minimum. So it, they're sort of flipped off each other. And this ensures again that our range lies between zero and one. So both invariance and selectivity are scores that would lie between zero and one for every neuron uh, for, for a data set. And, uh, as I, as I mentioned, we've treated category and viewpoint as symmetric in this in this in this um, project. So we can define selectivity selectivity with respect to category and invariance with respect to viewpoint as presented here. And you can also get the flip, which is selectivity with respect to viewpoint and invariance with respect to category using the same uh, methodology. Great. So selectivity and invariance are great, and you know there's a lot of work that talk about it, and we also sort of just formulated this whole system to quantify them. Uh, but it's, there's one important thing, one re important remaining chain here in between to, to be built, which is that all of these works that I've looked at them in the past uh, tend to be looking at a single task prediction case. So they're trying to do category prediction, and then they talk about viewpoint invariance, uh, which we, we know is great. You know, generalization, if you want to get general, generalization across category prediction, uh, it's great to have category selective and viewpoint invariant neurons. Similarly, if you're doing general, if you, if you want to get general, generalization to viewpoint prediction, uh, it's great to have viewpoint selective and category invariant neurons. But what we're trying to do here is simultaneous prediction of category and viewpoint. Now that presents a big problem in this multitask setting because uh, neurons can't be selective and invariant to the same parameter simultaneously. So imagine if you're unaffected by the presence of viewpoint, you clearly cannot be firing differently from one, for one viewpoint than everything else. So you can't be selective to viewpoint, to a particular viewpoint, and also be invariant to viewpoint. So this is, is a major challenge and uh, there's no clear way how this could be resolved. So uh, what, we, what we proposed is there's a possibility that one way this could work out is what we call specialization, which is one way to resolve this issue is the emergence of two sets of neurons, two sets of specialized neurons where type one is category selective and viewpoint invariant and these enable great performance for category prediction. And the second is type two neurons which are viewpoint selective and category invariant. And these would enable great accuracy for viewpoint prediction. So if a network was to develop both of these kinds of neurons simultaneously, uh, you would have great accuracy on both tasks and, it would, and you would also not run into the problem where you can't be selective or invariant at the same time. So in principle, it's, it's a lot like division of labor in the network, which is being forced by multitask. Uh, so the first thing we did is we basically went and classified neurons as uh, category or viewpoint neurons. The way, so, so type one and type two neurons here in this case. And when we plot them for different data sets, we see uh, that it actually does happen. So what, what we're showing here in uh, the blue is again, separate networks and in the red is the shared networks. So what you see in the blue case for, for so the two different lines show the two different branches here, which is the category and the post branch. Uh, what we see is that almost all the neurons in the network become 100% type one or type two, depending upon the task they're being asked to predict. So the category branch of the separate architecture is going to be completely type one neurons uh, by the time you've shown enough data. And the, the viewpoint branch or the pose branch is going to be 100% type two neurons. Uh, but in the case where you have a shared network where the network is forced to retain information about both tasks 
where it's forced to learn a representation such that it can solve both tasks. There's a very neat split where neurons basically take up division of labor of type one and type two neurons. And um, one important, one interesting question here is why is there an exact 50% split? Um, and uh, we, we played around this with this a little bit and we found that depending upon the loss that you use for training the networks, uh, the, the weightage you give to different, uh, different functions and the different tasks for category and viewpoint prediction, uh, this, this ratio keeps changing around depending upon the loss, the, the ratios of the loss. So essentially, uh, what we see here is that this interesting thing emerges in a multitask setting uh, because neurons now are forced to, so, to become category selective and viewpoint invariant and viewpoint selective and category invariant when you're testing generalization. Um, and they end up taking these two separate roles. So in order to quantify this behavior, we define something called a specialization score, which is an extension of selectivity and invariance and takes into account this division of labor. So for a particular neuron, for a neuron, for a neuron K, we would first go and check if it's a category neuron or a pose neuron. And if it's, and depending upon that definition, we can take uh, the, the, the geometric mean of the selectivity and invariance and define that as a specialization score. So just to take a look at how this changes as we play around with different layers in the network, what we can see is that specialization is building as we move forward into the network, which is a lot like how you see uh, generalize, uh, the, the selectivity and invariance build. So, so it, it, it makes sense because you know we're basically uh, building this up of a selectivity and invariance, but because this is um, a geometric uh, mean, it doesn't necessarily need to follow the same trends. The reason it's following the same trends is because it, it just showcases the fact that there's a clear division of labor into two different sets of categories of neurons. So one good thing that we find about the specialization uh, score is that specialization score correlates with generalization. So uh, as you can see here, um, as we move forward along the right on the x-axis, uh, you see an increase in specialization score, just as we saw an, saw an increase in generalization performance. And while there's one or two dips here in the red one, that's because those networks aren't actually generalizing well. So for the blue lines, we do generalize well. Um, we see that there's always an increase in the specialization score every time there's an increase in the generalization performance. So, and, and we tested this again with you know, interpolating between the shared and the separate architectures, and this shows the same. So what, what this specialization score is doing is that it's allowing us to capture the generalization behavior with one single metric where uh, generalization is, is being captured by this metric, which could not have been captured by just selectivity and invariance because of the whole multitask problem where you need two different kinds of, you have two different kinds of regimes going on. So uh, in essence, uh, specialization score uh, is great because it allows us to understand how generalization is changing across different scene combinations. So when you show some more combinations, you get better performance on unseen combinations. And you also see that there is an increase in the specialization of your neurons. So uh, we basically provide correlational evidence that specialization here is driving generalization in multitask settings. So it's basically adopting, adapting the same role that invariance and selectivity have adapted, ha have taken in standard um, single task prediction works. So it's, it's basically an extension which captures generalization behavior. And in the separate architecture case, uh, it's, it's very easy for the networks to get specialized because the first, first branch here, the category branch, doesn't need to retain any information about the pose or the viewpoint. So what it can do is it can get rid of all that information and all the neurons can become specialized to, to category prediction, which means they're category selective and viewpoint or pose invariant. The second branch here, which is the separate branch, uh, uh, which, is, which is the post prediction branch or the viewpoint prediction branch can completely lose all information about category and it can just focus and become specialized th to this one task. Uh, the shared case presents a problem. Uh, what we see here is that these neurons are actually splitting into two different kinds of neurons. So the shared architecture is trying really hard to become split into two kinds of specialized neurons. It's trying to behave like a separate architecture as we optimize it, as we train it over time, as it sees more data, but it can only do so much. Uh, it can't fight a network which has been by design given the property which is helping it. And, and that's the reason why specialization comes by design in separate networks and allows them to generalize better. So it is this capability to specialize, which comes for free in this architectural decision, uh, which is enabling shared networks, which is enabling se separate networks to outperform shared ones. So um, in conclusion, uh, we looked at two different questions and, and the idea always was to test multitask uh, multi-task generalization, which is we show different train combinations of category and viewpoint, and then we test on some combinations that haven't been seen before. So the first question is, do CNN generalize in this context? 
And the great answer is yes, they hope, there is hope, they do generalize. And uh, if we do the right things with the architectures and with the data diversity, there's hope that networks would be able to handle cases which they have never seen before. Uh, what is the role of data diversity in this in this extrapolation behavior? Uh, we see that diversity can help networks generalize to even unseen settings. Uh, the role of architecture is that separate architectures significantly outperform shared ones, uh, which brought us to our second question of why is all of this happening? What are the neural mechanisms driving this generalization behavior? Uh, and the answer that we found for that is in multitask settings, specialization plays the same role as selectivity and variance to in single task settings. And it is the specialization score, which is capturing uh, how well neurons get, get division of labor in the network and how well they can handle both tasks simultaneously. And this is also the reason why separate ones outperform shared ones, because it gets a specialization by default, by design in separate networks, which enables better generalization. Great, so in terms of future work, as I alluded to earlier, uh, th there's a bunch of different extensions that we are working on right now and we're excited about. Uh, we would also love to hear more about potential ext uh, extensions that you that you have in mind. Uh, please do share them with me. So first thing that we're trying is we talked about uh, this formulation of invariance that we're using, and we saw that it, it does sort of correlate very well with generalization behavior. So to sort of go beyond correlational behavior and to actually check causational behavior, what we're doing is, uh, can we enforce invariance and, and can that lead to better classification? So this is a slight shift in the sense that this is a single task prediction case. We're only doing classification or object recognition, but uh, we're trying to see if this formulation of invariance can actually enable better robustness to out of distribution uh, test, case, test cases. Uh, the second thing is uh, going beyond individual neurons. So the, the work that we, that we presented here, we saw that individual neurons are driving a lot of the behavior. But what if we extend this to more complex settings like more than two tasks? They say if we're solving something like 30 tasks at a time, or what if we're trying to uh, have more than say, right now we had like five to 10 different categories uh, five to and five to 10 different viewpoints. What if we went to something like a thousand categories like an image net? Uh, would individual neurons still be enough? Or would we look at would, would we need to look at more complex kinds of selectivity, selectivity invariance specialization, uh, which would be at the multiple neuron level? So that's, uh, it, it's a more complex extension, but I, I personally am quite excited about this to see if we can go beyond individual neurons to test multiple neurons at a time um, and what we can get from there. And thirdly, we are we're interested in extending to general multitask networks. So right now we talked within the context of category and viewpoint prediction, essentially because the two fundamental tasks in computer vision uh, that a lot of other computer vision relies on. Uh, but what about lighting, for example? Can we make, uh, how, how about category prediction with light invariance uh, instead of viewpoint invariance? So I, I'm personally quite excited about that as well, especially uh, lighting artifacts and lighting uh, invariance. And finally, there's the idea of extending beyond two tasks. Uh, can we do five tasks or 10 tasks at a time? And what would those tasks look like? And would it make a difference if one task is easier or harder, if two tasks are more related to each other? There's a lot of complexity there uh, that can come about in a multitask setting. So that's that's some of the future work ideas that I have and, and we are sort of pushing on. And yeah, that's that basically brings me to the end of the presentation. And thank you a lot for, for listening. And if you would like to read the paper, you can scan this QR code. Uh, you can drop me an email. And of course, uh, if you want to access the data set that we mentioned earlier, or if you would like to create such images for yourself, do drop me an email. I would, I would love to talk more. And yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, Svangan, for a great talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Modern, for this wonderful talk. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, my question is that, you know, I mean, there is a hell lot of area around the domain adaptation, which kind of, you know, try to address the same problem, uh, what you were trying to address, right? So uh, uh, will it be, you know, a good exercise to test your uh, theories on those kind of data sets uh, where they are, you know, testing their domain adaptation tasks? Right, that's a good point. And I think, uh, so So there is definitely domain adaptation can is, is, you know, can be seen as working on uh, data that is beyond what you were trained on. There's two differences though. One is that in a typical domain adaptation case, you would basically then get some trained data and you would retrain on that new data. And now you should be ready to, to solve that new, new data distribution. 
uh, we want to test. We don't. We don't want to train on the new domain. We just want to test on a new domain to test how how the network is generalized beyond training data because you can't really have training data for all possible settings. That being said, it is an interesting related, um, uh, I guess, idea. Uh, another important factor there is that uh, to do something like this, to do this kind of analysis, we would need a control over the jo the joint distribution in in the original training data and the and the uh, like domain to be adapted to. So that's that's tricky getting. Uh, control over joint distribution of the data so that we can actually run controlled analysis. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. So maybe I missed this, but when you're generating the like unseen data, is it unseen on, on both? Uh, on both categories or is it seen in one of the categories and then seen on the other? So it's unseen on both category and viewpoint. Uh, and so, but at the same time, you have to show the marginals always in the sense that, you know, so for example, if I, so, I mean, I'm just going to give you, a, you know, a quick demonstration. Like if I have this coffee mug and if I have this, you know, grapefruit drink thing, uh, and if I never show you a grapefruit drink thing, you can never predict it from a new pose. So you need to see the marginals for everything at least once. Uh, but you don't need to see the joint distribution completely. You don't need to see it across all variations. So that's why when we picked the test set and the train set, we ensured that everything, we pick at least one from every column and one from each row, which means that it's at least seen once uh, from one viewpoint or that viewpoint is at least seen once in one particular car. Yeah, we, we also did run the study where, you know, we would test, like show the entire uh, distribution across one and then test on only one other thing instead of testing on like cells, but testing on like rows and columns. Uh, but yeah, essentially we see similar behavior across those settings as well. So this seems like a, a pretty clear cut case where having um, or being able to sort of separate the two problems of, you know, viewpoint invariance, also object invariance. Um, is is helpful and it sort of intuitively makes sense that you want to have kind of two different branches in your multitask learning architecture for those. But uh, in some multitask settings, it might not be totally clear whether you can get performance gains by sharing parameters or not. Um, do you have any ideas about how you might use this kind of analysis framework to help figure out um, without having to run all these experiments, whether uh, the, the tasks that you're trying to predict might be amenable to sharing parameters? Right, that, that's a good point. And uh, that's another axis that hasn't been, like, hasn't been explored here for sure in the sense that uh, what is the relation, like how does the relationship between the two tasks impact all of this analysis is slightly unclear. Uh, we do believe, I mean, based, of, based on my intuition and like the discussions we've had, I feel, we feel that, you know, we can, probably extend a uh, specialization to understand how our networks are behaving. Like if we can measure specialization in the network architecture, that might be indicative of generalization performance. So maybe that can be used. Um, a, a more controlled case would be to actually to develop um, a relationship between, you know, uh, task overlap, so to say, and generalization behavior. But that seems like a fairly hard thing. So maybe this presents a middle ground in between where you can you don't need to understand the task relationship. As long as you can measure uh, specialization, you can actually predict, uh, at least correlationally, uh, it can suggest that generalization is going to be better. So maybe that can be used. Uh, just using the same uh, methodology, the grid-based approach and the formula that we've mentioned to measure specialization. That's cool. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, in that case, uh, thanks a lot, Spandan, for coming and thanks for the great talk. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I really appreciate the feedback and, and, and everybody's time.